three consecutive life terms in federal prison for a first-time nonviolent offense. That was the verdict for 24-year-old Clarence Aaron after he was convicted essentially for in introducing a drug supplier to a classmate whose brother was a dealer and being present during the sale of nine kilograms of cocaine. Sound excessive? Well, he did come close to being pardoned during the Bush administration, but the, an error by made by the Department of Justice meant that he ended up being refused. Clarence was actually one of eight people who had their sentences commuted by President Obama earlier this week, and in a statement the president said, quote, Today I'm commuting the prison terms of eight men and women who were sentenced under an unfair system. Each of them has served more than 15 years in prison. In several cases, the sentencing judges expressed frustration that the law at the time did not allow them to issue punishments that more appropriately fit the crime. Now, this, in addition to steps taken earlier this year by Attorney General Eric Holder, are part of a renewed effort to reform sentencing requirements for nonviolent offenders. Since the 1980s, start of the war on drugs, the U.S. prison population has more than quadrupled, from 500,000 to 2.4 million. One of the primary reasons for the increase, mandatory minimum sentencing. Originally marketed as a way to be tough on crime, mandatory minimums and three strikes laws have resulted in overcrowding prisons and unequal application of the laws. Now, the issue's gotten renewed interest for two basic reasons, the overcrowding and the significant cost. In 2012 alone, taxpayers spent almost $60 billion on prisons and jails. And a 2008 study commissioned by Families Against Mandatory Minimums found that actually six in 10 Americans oppose mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent crimes. In his five years in office, President Obama has actually worked hard to curb these unfair practices, including the authorization of the Fair Sentencing Act. It's a law that eliminated the five-year mandatory minimum sentence for simple possession of crack cocaine and reduced the racially discriminatory sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. But while the Fair Sentencing Act has helped balance the scales for new offenders, its powers are not retroactive and thus do little to help the estimated 8,800 inmates who are still serving time for crack cocaine charges. Now, on Thursday, when the president used his authority to free eight people and make clear, and he made clear that this is an important issue. There's plenty to be, more to be done on this front, though. Joining me now, co-director of the Advancement Project, Judith Brown Dianis, an MSNBC contributor and Huffington Post Washington bureau chief, Ryan Grimm. Ryan is also, I shall mention, uh, the author of This Is Your Country on Drugs, The Secret History of Getting High in America. Thanks to you both. It sounds very appropriate for the conversation, doesn't it? Indeed. Uh, thanks to you both. Judith, I want to start with you because, you know, this issue of mass incarceration, you know, when we talk about it and we talk about overcrowding, the other piece of it, though, that I think is really important is that it's profitable. I mean, you know, there are companies making almost $3 billion uh, in, in 2010. That's right. I mean, we have major uh, companies who are profiting off of bodies being pushed into this system. Um, the more bodies, you know, because we're, we're breaking down what used to be um, the government's role in, in prisons and instead building private prisons that are being um, paid for by tax dollars, right? And so, and when we look at the people who are behind the bars, of course, we know that they are disproportionately black and brown people who are on the other end of, um, of our so-called criminal justice system. And I have to right. say that President Obama was, um, did the right thing here. You know, we, ha we have a principle in our country that is equal justice under the law. And what he did and the Fair Sentencing Act is actually putting equal back into our justice system. You know, I agree with that. And actually, Ryan, I think we had a pretty interesting and dramatic example in the last couple of weeks with the affluenza judge and this affluenza as a, as a new uh, defense mechanism. But one of the things that was interesting, Business Insider reported that that same judge sentenced a 14-year-old black kid to 10 years in juvie uh, for a much lesser offense. So clearly, justice is not being distributed equally. Right. And what we have to remember is that it's not just uh, that this system creates kind of racist outcomes. In a lot of ways, you can make the argument that it's racist by design. I mean, That's if right. you think mm -hmm. about the climate in which these laws were created, you know, this began in the 60s, and actually, and Democrats are, are not blameless here. Sure. Arlen Specter was the first one who ran a kind of a, a race baiting law and order uh, ad, and this was in, I think, 1965 when he was running for, like, Pennsylvania Attorney General. But then after that, when Nixon developed his Southern strategy, which was then 
expanded on by President Reagan, it was all law and order, and it was playing to white resentment. Mm -hmm. And the policy response to that was to create these mandatory minimums that 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 targeted African Americans. And so, right. it, so it's not a coincidence that 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 climate led to those laws, which led to this system. That's right. Yeah. And, and this ahead, one, in, this one in particular, sorry, Karen, this one in particular, the crack cocaine sentencing came after um, the death of Len Bias, the mm -hmm. um, the basketball star. Right. And really, you know, this was like supposed to be this like let's crack down on crime and crack right. cocaine that's happening in urban areas, right? But it's like New York City, you know, Harlem and um, the South Bronx. But let's not crack crack down on cocaine that's being dealt in, on Wall Street. Wow. And so we had racialized affluenza lawmaking. <laughs> right. And if you're affluent, you can claim that actually as a defense, despite the fact that you could be not affluent and have right. bad parents. I want to, a point that I know you uh, work on, Judith, as well, is this really starts a lot earlier than mm -hmm. I think we realize. I mean, it starts in the schools and the way kids are treated in schools and the that's way right. kids are punished in schools. And I know you guys talk about the sort of school to prison pipeline. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, you, you know, every day we see young people of color being hit harder uh, in schools with suspensions, but also criminalized. You know, we have five-year-olds who are being arrested, African-American five-year-olds arrested for temper tantrum. And it's not something that happens in isolation. You know, we are seeing that more than ever. And, you know, so we are starting mass incarceration in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And for black and Latino children, they're disproportionately in impacted by this. So, you know, we have to look at this system of both from schools to the juvenile justice system to the criminal justice system and realize that we are treating uh, communities of color har more harshly. Mm -hmm. We're more likely to be policed, more likely to be arrested, more likely to, to get a prison sentence, more likely to lose our voting rights on the other end. Right. And, you know, and this is all through legislation. You know, Ryan, so let's talk solutions because, I, you know, we talk problems, but let's talk solutions. Uh, there, the Fair Sentencing Act we just talked about, obviously part of the problem is that it's not retroactive. So now there are a number of other uh, initiatives like the Smarter Sentencing Act, Justice Safety Valve, Act and the Recidivism Reduction Act, all sort of in Congress. I mean, I think what's important is, you know, it's important that the president actually used his power to move this issue forward uh, and take a stand. And at the same time, there are other solutions that are in before Congress that seem like they have bipartisan support at this point. Right. I mean, well, I think immediately, you know, the president and all of the governors should should look at the sentences of anybody you know, who, who was sentenced under these racist mandatory minimum laws and, and send them out, you know, commute, commute those sentences. If, you, you know, if we have decided that we're not going to have this disparity between crack and cocaine, mm -hmm. it's, it's blatantly unfair to leave people in prison because they happen to be convicted at, at a different time. The, the second thing that, that, that you could do is to take away the incentives for local governments to wage the drug war. You know, they're, they're really, you know, if, if local cops and state cops were left to their own devices, they wouldn't actually be knocking down people's doors o over pot or small amounts of cocaine because, you know, they have much bigger problems to deal with. Mm -hmm. But the, the federal government entices them to do that by saying that, well, hey, you know, A, you can keep anything uh, that you can collect as part of a drug raid, and you don't even have to prove that what you've collected is part of a drug operation. In fact, instead, the person that had the stuff taken from them has to go and, and pursue it. And often these are you know, poor people, and you've taken all of their a assets, so it's right. hard for them to, to raise a defense. <laughs> and then there are also grants and such that go out and buy all, all, all this military equipment. If you just took that away and let the states and local governments decide, I think that they would decide that it wasn't in their interest to wage a drug war. And final word to you, Judith, but I think isn't there also an issue here of giving judges, I think this is part of what the president's also trying to drive towards, giving judges more discretion in sentencing. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, affluenza, we need right. to keep an eye on that. Right. But that in some cases, that could really make a huge difference. That's right. I mean, judges see too many people moving through the system, and they know that um, there is significant recidivism, and they know that, you know, that people keep coming back. And they really should have some discretion to come up with the right kind of solution for people who are before them, and really to take into account circumstances. But as you said, 
Karen, you know, we have to also monitor that because right. often we also know that judges have perceptions of young people and, and people of color um, that are skewed and biased. And right. so we have to make sure that they're doling out equal justice. All right. Thank you, Judith Brown, Diana, and Ryan Grimm. You guys are awesome. And Merry happy Christmas. Happy holidays. <laughs> or happy holidays. Whatever you celebrate. <laughs> happy. Later in this hour, a nightmare before Christmas. You remember those Tea Party hostage takers? They're back and they're ready to strike again. That's coming up.